Chancellor. The Vice-Chancellor will present Sir Hubert Opperman, OBE, for award of the degree of Doctor of the University. However, before the presentation, we will view a short video of Sir Hubert's outstanding achievements. Amazing honour. Four times Australian road champion. Rode in the Tour de France in 1928 and 1931. Won the world's longest road race, the Paris Brest Paris. Won the French Bol d'Or, 24 hour track race. In the 1,000 miles motor pace ride in Sydney, he broke 101 records. Broke the record for the Perth to Sydney, cheered on by thousands. Hubert Oppenheim, or Oppie as he's more affectionately known, was probably the greatest endurance cyclist the world has ever seen. Hubert Oppenheim was born in 1904 at Rochester, north of Bendigo in Victoria. He was one of four children. His ancestors on his father's side had come from Germany to South Australia in 1853. His mother's ancestors were Scottish. At eight, Oppie discovered bikes. I'll never forget the joy that I had when I finally conquered it and uh, balanced and pedaled. I uh, resolved if I ever could take up a sport, it would be cycling. But first, a job. He joined the post office as a telegram messenger. Cycling all day delivering telegrams meant that Oppie built up stamina and strength. He started racing on the weekends, and at 17 he had his first success in the 10-mile event. His lifelong passion for cycling had begun. With Malvern Star sponsorship behind him, Oppie's cycling career took off. He won the Launceston to Hobart in 1922. Bruce Small quickly became Oppie's cycling manager and boss when he encouraged him to leave the post office and join the Malvern Star business. Bruce Small was a father and manager and mentor and commercial advisor for me. Oppie's riding went from strength to strength, winning the 1927 Dunlop Grand Prix, over a thousand kilometres in four stages. The Sporting Globe newspaper rallied the public and raised £1,250 to send a four-man team to the greatest road race in the world, the Tour de France. And the public demanded that we go over to France and clean them frogs up, you know. <laughs> the Tour de France was over 5,000 kilometres, run in 22 stages over four weeks with la creme de la creme of cyclists participating over some of the most treacherous and gruelling terrain. Oppie had completed not just one superhuman feat, but two. He'd won the bold d'Or under the gaze of adoring crowds, breaking two world records after 24 hours of racing. Then rode for another 79 minutes to break the 1,000-kilometre world record. They called uh, me after the race the phenomenon, and uh, that... To uh, have praise like that in France was uh, just nectar to me. Europe was ecstatic. He was voted the most popular athlete by a French sporting magazine. He returned to Australia 24 years old, the most famous Australian athlete Europe had known. In 1939, the Second World War began. And it was this world event which led to the quiet retirement of one of the world's greatest cyclists. At age 37, Hubert Oppenman joined the RAAF as a PT trainer. When the war ended, Oppie returned to Malvern Star, but his life was about to change. The government wanted to repossess some land, and the residents organised a protest meeting. He was once again thrust into the public eye. They were short of a speaker, and they hauled me up on the platform. <laughs> I uh, don't remember what I said uh, politically, but uh, it was again the government, I know. Prime Minister Menzies welcomed him to the government in 1949. Liberal member for Carrillo in what had been a Labour electorate. 
He was to hold that electorate for the next 18 years until he retired from politics. As the years have progressed, Sir Hubert Offerman has become a grand old man of sight, and the sheer number of races and records that he broke still seem incredible. The French still hold him dear to their hearts. In 1991, he was invited to Paris for the anniversary of the Paris Brest Paris, which he'd won 60 years earlier. However, at 90, Sir Hubert Offerman did finally give up cycling, but not without a ceremony. As a tribute to this great Australian cyclist, Rochester, the home of his birth, has dedicated an Oppie Museum to his great feats and achievements and a statue for posterity. I suppose deep down I felt that uh, I was uh, had uh, something that uh, other fellows didn't have. With the authority of the Council, I shall now confer the degree of Doctor of the University. I call upon the Vice-Chancellor to make this presentation. <laughs> Chancellor, the Council of the University has resolved to confer the degree of Doctor of the University on Sir Hubert Offerman, OBE. Hubert Ferdinand Opperman was born in Rochester, Victoria in May 1904. He developed a fascination for bike riding at an early age, building strength and stamina by cycling around the suburb of Malvern, delivering telegrams to the local post office. In 1921, Hubert Opperman won his first major race at the age of 17, and later that year secured a job with Bruce Small's Malvern Star Cycles. This move was the beginning of a formidable partnership that would become legendary in the world of competitive cycling. Through amazing feats of endurance over a 20-year period, Hubert Opperman rose to become Australia's greatest cyclist and one of the greatest sportsmen in this country's history. Although excelling in any type of event, marathon races were his specialty. He was Australian road champion four times and captured, uh, captained the nation's Tour de France team in 1928 and 1931. One of his greatest triumphs overseas was in winning the Bol d'Or, a 24-hour endurance race in Paris in 1928. After having both his racing bikes uh, sabotaged, Hubert Oppen was forced within the first hour of the race to borrow his interpreter's bike, an old roadster with mudguards, lamp, brakes, and upturned handlebars. Although lapped 17 times before remounting his repaired racing machine, he put up a superhuman effort to win the race, taking the lead within the 11 hour mark and then riding for another 12 hours without stopping. Encouraged by the enthusiastic support of a 50,000 strong crowd, Hubert Opperman continued cycling after the finish of the race to break the world record for 1,000 kilometres an effort which took a further 79 minutes of pedalling. Such feats of courage and determination were to be repeated. In 1931, he contested Paris, Brest Paris, with the long, longest road race in one stage in the world. Attracting the best cyclists from around the globe, the gruelling 1200 metre, uh, 1200 kilometre marathon required superb physical fitness and stamina. 
battling torrential rain and cold winds, Hubert Opperman won the race in a new course record time of 49 hours and 21 minutes, establishing himself as the best endurance rider in the world. He confirmed this title in England by breaking the record for riding the length of Britain from Land's End in the south to John O'Groats in the north. Back in Australia, Hubert Opperman set records against the clock and against the terrain. He broke all motor paste records in a 1,000 mile ride in Sydney and set a world record for riding 1,000 miles around the Melbourne Motordrome in 24 hours. In his longest solo ride, Hubert Opperman suffered atrocious road conditions across the Nullarbor before setting a record for riding from Fremantle to Sydney in 13 days, 10 hours and 11 minutes, eclipsing the old record by five and a half days. His cycling effort, efforts at this time put even the rail system to shame. <laughs> riding from Albany to Perth in 12 hours, two and a half hours less than the same journey by train. Finally, in 1940, after almost 20 years of racing, Hubert Opperman broke 101 track records in a 24-hour unpaced ride in Sydney. The advent, advent of the Second World War ended Hubert Opperman's career as a professional cyclist. He served the RAF from 1940 to 1945 and was commissioned as a flight lieutenant in 1942. In the 1950s, he pursued a new career as a federal politician winning the Victorian seat of Carayo in 1949, a seat he held until 1967. After serving as Chief Government Whip from 1955 to 1960, Hubert Oppenman was appointed as Minister for Shipping and Transport from 1960 to 1963, and as Minister for Immigration from 1963 to 1966, bringing to each position the same dedication and integrity of purpose as he displayed in his cycling days. After retiring from politics, he served as Australian High Commissioner to Malta from 1967 to 1972. Continuing a life of public service, Sir Hubert Opperman has been committed to passing on his great experience and his administrative skills for the advancement of sport in Australia. He has been the national patron for the Australian Sportsmen's Association since 1980, and Chairman of the Selection Committee for the Australian Hall of Sporting Fame since 1985. He was also appointed Honorary Master of Sport by the Confederation of Australian Sport in 1984. Sir Hubert has received many prestigious awards in a long and distinguished career. Having received an OBE in 1952, he was knighted in 1968 and was made a Knight Grand Cross of Justice Order of St John of Jerusalem in 1980. Recognition of his outstanding achievements in cycling has led to numerous honours overseas, including the Coronation Medal, 1953, the Silver and Gold Medal, City of Paris in 1971 and 1991 respectively, the Medals of Brest, 1972 and Verona, 1972, and the Medal of Merit of the French Cycling Federation in 1978. In Australia, Sir Hubert Opperman's legendary cycling efforts were accorded the acclaim they deserve when he was selected as one of 200 people who made Australia great by Heritage 200 in 1988. As Australia prepares for the Olympic Games in Sydney, the achievements of Sir Hubert Opperman should inspire all athletes not only to review and re revise their target performance levels, but they should remind us all that sporting achievement and community service can continue to combine to make Australia great. It is therefore especially fitting that the Council of Griffith University should honour Sir Hubert Opperman in recognition of his distinguished services to sport and the community. Chancellor, it is a great pleasure that I present to you Sir Hubert Opperman for admission to the degree of Doctor of the University.
I now call upon Sir Hubert Opperman, OBE, Doctor of the University, to deliver the occasional address. Vice-Chancellor and uh, distinguished guests, my fellow graduates, ladies and gentlemen, I have a distinct sense of privilege in being invited here this evening. The word privilege is so often casually applied, particularly in politics. During an election campaign, the candidate usually prefaces his speech with the term privilege when he would rather be home in bed. <laughs> but I am rather overwhelmed by this occasion, particularly by my shortcut to this graduation. <laughs> Amongst all those who have won their spurs by the sweat of their brow and burning the midnight oil to mix my metaphors. I feel as though I am trading on past performance, longevity, sentiment and the ever increasing interest of the modern Australia regarding antiques. <laughs> but I use the word with sincere emphasis, for I am very conscious of this honour bestowed on me by the Chancellor, <laughs> the, uh, the Vice-Councillor, <laughs> the Council and the Griffith University. I am also very conscious of my age and Ben Johnson's observation that it was a near miracle to see an old man silent, for talking is a disease of age, which makes some of our, the Canberra politicians as old as the French woman who turned 120 last month. <laughs> the designation of my degree is health and behavioural science. Before I speak to my brief, I must warn you that the personal pronoun intrudes into my words. But from my perspective of advanced years, it is another life and another person I am speaking of and modesty dissolves under the pressure of ver 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 veracity. A good health, as a good health is the foundation of a good performance in every area of effort, mental or physical, I have pursued it all the years since I learned that a surfeit of protein upset my in internal workings. I will return to this subject later on. <laughs> I have had the attention during the past decade of various GPs and specialists in their respective spheres of skill and a bevy of nurses at our Selford Park retirement village with whom I regularly fall in love. <laughs> Plus a wife who answers the telephone, watches my blood, my blood pressure and medication, guards my appointment and generally acts as a home secretary. I pay tribute to all and reflect that even Rolls Royces wear out and have to be serviced. My boyhood days brought me satisfactory, nourishing country food. My early days in the post office gave me daily psych and exercise, 
during the formated physical years of my life. It is remarkable how in youthful days one could perform gastronomic <laughs> mayhem on one system and yet return excellent results. I was fortunate to live very, very temperate and a combination of circumstances prevents me from becoming an addict for tobacco. Francis Bacon's advice became reality eventually as I witnessed retired athletes and citizens smoking themselves into future ill health. And I quote, the strength of nature in youth passeth over the many excesses which are missing a man till his age. I used an excess of protein for energy and in 1937 broke out in painful boils, particularly in the region of the saddle. <laughs> Fortunately, I was steered onto the Dr. Hay diet, which advises not only selected foods, but warns against certain mixtures of such. It cured the boils, brought rejuvenation to the muscles, and I feel re and refreshed perspective on competition. I rode the Fremantle to Sydney on Dr. Hay and followed up by breaking the 24 hour unpaced record on track and road. I held my weight down in the RAF, but politics defeated me into defensive eating. <laughs> and that's a fact. <laughs> uh, they, uh, you got to the table after a session in the house and uh, sat down and uh, you couldn't pick a diet. You ate and ate and uh, I said to Tony Lucchetti who followed Shifley in the uh, Lithgow electorate you were putting on weight, Tony. And he said, I fight in the house, I fight in the branches, I fight at the branch meetings, and don't ask me to fight at the table. <laughs> I left for Malta, burdened with three and a half stones extra, weight from 10 stones 7 pounds, a legacy from the previous 17 and a half years in politics. The penalty of a major heart attack put me back on the track of culinary virtue and I stand here tonight racing weight once more and thirst to be present to accept this award. I further observe that my degree includes psychology and recollect that from the age of 16, I was associated with the well-known Sir Bruce Small. He was a natural psychologist, an extra, uh, extrovert personality. He had a logical philosophy which could lift and sustain the most wilting spirit in the commercial area and the most exhausted cyclist responded to his urging. He managed and followed the undermanned Australian team in the 1928 Tour de France of 5,000 kilometres in 22 stages. It was for us a month's brutal bicycle entry into the classics of continental competition against unknown riders, unknown roads, and with teams of 10 combined against our tour quartet. The wise men of the wheel world said we would be back in Paris within three stages. The mountain stage, eight of them, were actually cycling nightmares, leaving at midnight with a group of 150 
and facing 400 kilometres over the Pyrenees and Alps. Bruce Small cajoled, wheedled, threatened, pleaded each evening after every stage to keep us in the race. He maintained morale amongst the whole team, the mechanics, the masseurs, the transport drivers, and ultimately led his three remaining squad into 38th, 28th and 18th place. It was the highest form of practical psychology applied on a moving field of sport. It has been said that every man believes he's, he has something extraordinary to tell of himself. I'll recount an, extra, an extraordinary story, story to me at any rate, of the psychological link which existed between people. Such psychology influenced me to win the Paris Press Paris <coughs> of 1,200 kilometres, non-stop racing at 49 hours, 21 minutes, and held mercifully at 10-year intervals. I broke away from the remaining group in the final 80 kilometres. A chasing, pacing squad of four closed the gap of three minutes, three kilometres from the finishing line. I despaired. Then Bruce raced alongside in an open official car and shouted out, Keep it down, Moppy, they are dead. From no other would I have responded and kept breaking away to keep them tired. As a result, I won the finishing sprint on the track, but Bruce won it for me three kilometres up the road. Following the Tour de France, and the Paris Brest, I read an article by an emotional French journalist who had followed both events. He wrote, sport is not just a game in the sense of which the word is generally used. It is not a banal pastime, a simple distraction. When one is engaged in a fierce struggle with a rival or against time or distance, one is also battling implacably and in secret with moral forces against cowardice and laziness. It is that which enables sport. One cannot triumph without suffering. One cannot win laurels without meriting them. A prime requisite for the athlete is that he should know how to suffer. A victory on the road, on the track, or in the ring is the corollary of another victory won by force of energy and willpower. The easy life, the congenial climate, the sweetness of the air makes the idea of suffering repugnant. Naturally, the men who win battles on the arena or on the road are those who have been reared in the, in the hard school of necessity, who know the weakness of the flesh, and know that life's rises only, are only won by the sweat of the brow. These virtues are sometimes attributed to racial qualities, as if they were inborn, and as if suffering had not for all the same bitterness. As, a, as I review my contrasting years, I recognise that the race of life is composed of various stages, an experiencing one brings wisdom for another. These young graduates have won the first stage and how they apply the training received in the Griffith University depends on their own voluntary action to deal with the bewildering and rapid changes in commerce, professional, economic and social life. It will take dedication, determination, and consistency. And they have proved they have the basic ta talent for succeeding along the difficult, arduous road of study. In, in conclusion, I thank the Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor, 
and the council for their gesture and paying me the compliment of participating in this graduation ceremony. An honour which I will surprise, uh, will prize for the remainder of my life, short as it will conclude, maybe. <laughs> With some lines from here, um, Bellac, which I feel applies to us all. From quiet home and first beginning, out to the undiscovered ends, there's nothing worth the wear of winning, save laughter and the respect of friends. Thank you. to cover the uh, incidents in my life. And uh, I've only got two copies left and I've been preserving them for posterity. And uh, I'm so moved by the, by the ceremony here tonight and the honor you have paid me in the Griffith University that I want to give one of you at the Griffith University uh, one of the remaining two. This is a publication, first uh, issued in 1977. It's called, surprisingly, Pedals, Politics and People. And it's obviously uh, an autobiography of Sir Hubert dealing with uh, uh, an important uh, period of his life. We are very honoured to have one of your two remaining copies and uh, the copy you have presented to Griffith University, it's inscribed to Griffith University of Grateful Appreciation, Hubert Opperman. We shall treasure it and look after it. Thank you, Sir Hubert.